Across scorching deserts and vast freezing plains, the nomadic people of this region helped to create one of the most important trade routes in human history. The Silk Road. From great distances, commerce and culture traverse this ancient thoroughfare. And there are mysteries along the way. The Tower of Silence surrounded by sand, and a legendary lake that awaits travelers along the path. The Silk Road was reborn with the construction of the Eurasian Land Bridge. The railway crosses scorching deserts connecting the Near East with the Far, and in between, the little known regions of Central Asia. Bridging Beijing to Istanbul and winding over seven countries, the Silk Road is nearly 12,000 kilometers long. The scorching Silk Road. Ken Ogata, traveling along the Silk Road Railway Land Bridge, a path filled with the diverse cultures of the remarkable people who have made the desert their home. For Ken, this was a lone pilgrimage, but he was not traveling to a specific destination. He was on a journey of discovery, heading west. The trip was to begin at the Great Wall of China. In 1991, Ken Ogata traveled the length of the Great Wall of China from east to west on foot. At the west end of the wall, called by some the Great Dragon of China, this great stone structure disappears into the sand. As he stared at the horizon, he thought, the dragon has risen to the heavens. At the same moment, another thought entered his head. People must live towards the west in the desert. I wonder if I will ever meet the people that inhabit the land of the oasis.
Turfan, beyond the Great Wall of China. Ken Ogata's journey to follow the Silk Road started with Turfan, land of the oasis. The local population of the city is overwhelmingly Weiwur Muslim. In Shioji, a city whose name means journey to the west, the mountains look like great plumes of flame. They are devoid of any vegetation. The desolate landscape foretold the harsh journey ahead. Boarding a train in Beijing, Ken Ogata traveled 3,700 kilometers over three days and nights to reach Turfan. Urumqi is the next stop after Turfan. Traveling by the Silk Road Railway is not easy. This is not the Orient Express. And temperatures can drop to minus 20 degrees centigrade. From here, he will cross the border into Kazakhstan. Personal items are needed during this long journey that can take over 30 hours. Several days ago, there was a terrorist incident involving a Weiwur group calling for independence from China in the city of Urumqi. Security was tight at the station since the terrorist incident. The train's departure was announced. Ken Ogata made his way to the train. Please get on the train and pay attention to safety. <laughs> They showed their film permit to no avail. The train leaves only twice a week. Ken Ogata had to push his way onto the train. Today, 
一番寒い日だったなそれなのに汗びっしょりだよこちら。Here, passengers go through embarkation procedures. Two hours later, the train starts toward the border. Nanbe mo mita na ano kyo no sako. We arrive at Druzba, the first stop in Kazakhstan. Ken thought the dog belonged to a passenger, but it was actually a drug sniffing dog. Ken's quarters are thoroughly inspected. <laughs> A man who looks like a railway employee approaches Ken. He's willing to exchange Chinese UNs for Kazakhstan tenjis. It looks like a black market trade. But the rate wasn't bad. You sure? You want? Yeah? No, I don't. At the border, currency was not the only thing that needed conversion. At the Druzba station, the wheels and axles of the train must be changed. The distance between the rails is different in China and Kazakhstan. Crews labor at the conversion. The temperature was minus 30 degrees centigrade. During the conversion, passengers have to remain inside the train and cannot use the train's restroom. Ken Ogata could no longer wait. He headed toward the employee restroom. The facilities in this part of the world can be a bit crude, but as we said, this is not the Orient Express. It's a long sliver of steel stretched over an ancient path. Six hours later, when the train departed, the sky darkened and the moon appeared in the clouds. There was a dining car at the Druzba station, which passengers welcomed. Since his departure from Irumki and his last meal, it had been 20 hours. The menu consisted of saffron rice, borscht, and hamburger. The beer was from Holland.
In the past, it was caravans that crossed these snow-covered plains. The historic Silk Road bustled with commerce. The railroad has brought new life to the old route, which has become busy with trade in this nearly forgotten part of the world. Ken's next stop was Ashtana, the capital of Kazakhstan. After boarding the train from the heavily guarded station at Urumqi, the next leg of the 2,000 kilometer journey began. A woman selling pierogies for 8 yen each asked Ken, where are you from? Japanese are rarely seen in these parts. In Kazakhstan, over 100 ethnic groups coexist. When the Soviet Union disbanded, many nations in Central Asia became independent. Kazakhstan was part of the USSR, but is now an independent nation. A year after its independence, with the opening of the railway that connects Kazakhstan to China, the cities quickly filled with Chinese products. Recently, however, the situation has changed, and products from Middle Eastern Islamic countries now fill the marketplaces. Ken Ogata bought a watch at the bazaar. It was made in the UAE, the United Arab Emirates. The money exchanged at the Druzba station has come in handy. <laughs> The Silk Road Railway crosses the Tian Shan Ranges and enters a neighboring nation, Kyrgyzstan, which is also known as the Switzerland of Central Asia. The next destination is the legendary lake Isak Kul, where the remains of a mysterious ancient culture sleep beneath the water. En route to the lake, we found a field littered with stone statues. These Gokturk sculptures are thought to be tombs of fallen warriors. The Gokturk were one of many tribes that conquered the plains surrounding the Silk Road. They were a nomadic tribe from Turkey. The lore of Lake Isik Kul is filled with numerous legends. Gata picks up what's thought to be an animal bone, but it looks like the remains of a human being. Human bones?
skeletal remains litter the shores of the lake. It's almost as if the lake was trying to tell Ken a story. Bones line the shore. But whose bones are they? And how did they get there? This is just one of the mysteries of Lake Isikul. Starting with the Scythian graves, this lake covers the remains of various cities that sprung up during the glory days of the Silk Road. An earthquake or a sudden flood was thought to have destroyed these ancient cultures. But the bones littering the shore remain a mystery to this day. The Scythians were one of the earliest nomadic cultures to roam the plains of Eurasia. In the Tian Shan ranges, various artifacts have been unearthed. One of the most famous finds is this fantastic suit of golden armor. A mummy of a young prince in his teens was found wearing it. The people of Lake Isikul have remained nomadic and self-sufficient, like their ancestors. The strong members are shepherds. The weak members farm. They take great pride in their culture, which is essential for survival in this harsh environment. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> <laughs> スコール。いくつ<笑> あの、え、断食のあの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの
After the fall of the Soviet Union, Uzbeks were freed from religious persecution and Islam flourished once again. However, women were wearing short skirts in the newly constructed area of the city. Tashkent has one of the only subways in Central Asia. The train is a melting pot of cultures. About a year ago, a new trend hit the city of Tashkent. On the west side, stores are filled with modern merchandise. There is also an outdoor karaoke bar. Drinking European beer, smoking American cigarettes. The kids sing rock and roll using karaoke machines made in Korea. It costs 80 yen per song here. The average income in Tashkent is about 3,000 yen a month. But karaoke is so popular, young men and women form long lines waiting for their turn to sing. And it can get cold here, with temperatures dropping to minus 20 degrees centigrade. Later that night, Ken left Tashkent and headed for Samarkand, the former capital of the Timur Empire. When Ken arrived the next morning, Samarkand, the blue city, was covered in snow. In the Middle Ages, Samarkand fell to two great men. The first was Genghis Khan, who destroyed the city. The second, Tamerlane, who rebuilt it and set out to make it a city without parallel. After its reconstruction, it became known as the Asian Rome. After Uzbekistan's independence, the mosques and graveyards neglected after years of Soviet rule were repaired and Islam flourished in this city once again. There are five pillars of Islam. Belief in the oneness of God, daily prayer, charity, self-purification, and the pilgrimage to Mecca. Fasting takes place in the ninth month of the Islamic calendar. was to end the next day. People in the area surrounding Samarkand had started to pour into a small village called Garlalol to break the month-long fast. <laughs> Two hundred men have filled the village square. Everyone will break the fast together. The public slaughtering of a sheep begins the preparation for the meal to end the fast. Thank <laughs> you. 
However, it is not yet time. Until then, the men wait quietly. They neither eat nor drink. And before the fast ends, there are special prayers to be said. Suddenly, the men start to rise. The time has come for the prayers that will end the fast. The men walk to a new mosque built after Uzbekistan was free of Soviet rule. Ramadan is the month when Muslims have the opportunity to get closer to God and seek the forgiveness of sins. During that time, Muslims cannot eat or drink during the day. Devout Muslims will stop smoking, will not associate with the opposite sex, or even swallow their own saliva during this time. <laughs> The pilaf to celebrate the end of Ramadan has finished cooking. Finally, the time has come. When daybreak arrives, the men place a raisin in their mouths, then slowly savor and chew it. Their feelings of gratitude to God pour out naturally during this time. After a month of fasting, they celebrate into the night with food. In separate rooms, women are also eating. <laughs> Ken Ogata joins the feast. <laughs> After the long fast, this is indeed a great celebration. <laughs> A young boy sat all alone in the corner of the mosque reading the Quran amidst the festivities. This young man began living in the mosque four years ago when he was just 14. He hopes to become a cleric. He wants to teach in a Muslim school in the future. As you can hear, he intones the reading. <laughs> Rahim. 
。ええー、なんか、顔はすごく硬いんですけど、最後の握手はすごくしっかりしてて。ええー、いいです。ありがとう。ありがとう。Next morning, Registan, the central square in Samarkand, is filled with 20,000 people. It was a celebration marking the end of Ramadan, called Idul Fitur. Has traveled through four nations in bitter cold along the path of the Silk Road. The lives of the people of this region are filled with difficulty. It seems like they pray to Mecca to take back the days lost under Soviet rule. Ken's journey has its difficulties too. He's on a solitary pilgrimage. Ken was thinking, "I'll just keep moving forward until the road ends. I haven't finished half my trip." Summertime has come to the Silk Road. The summer journey for Ken Ogata starts at Lake Isik Kul in Kyrgyzstan. He is here to visit Mr. Urukari, as he promised earlier. The emerald green prairie glows in the sun. Six months ago, Mr. Urukari greeted them, saying that guests were gods. As Mr. Urukari had promised, he had prepared a yurt on the prairie. Mr. Urukari said, "We have no telephone here, no TV, no doctors. However, I have my kids and grandchildren. I cannot ask for more." <laughs> あんまり便利にならない方が本当はいいんですよね。だだだ。そう、自然、自然の中に生きてるってことは大事なことですよね。はい、じゃあ、取ります。Mr. Urukari's family is quite large: six sons, seven daughters, and thirty grandchildren. How are you, kid? It was time to say goodbye and continue the pilgrimage. As the train raced along the Silk Road, Ken looked forward to it, but knew that as much as there would be fantastic discoveries, there would be hardship. Whatever the journey had in store, Ken was ready. Hey! Hey! Hey! 
Ken Ugata's train arrived in the old city of Bukhara in Uzbekistan. The station was in total chaos, filled with people heading to Turkmenistan, a neighboring country. Why do they want to go to Turkmenistan so badly? Inside the train, a Bukhara merchant told Ken why. It's desert over there, so we can sell the produce for a lot more money. They have about 60 kilograms of carrots, worth 30 yen per kilogram. They're going to travel five hours to make about 1,800 yen approximately 18 U.S. dollars. <laughs> the merchant is selling sheep yogurt. But refuses to take Ken's money. Ken's a guest from a foreign country. The scene at the station was quite different. The conductor shouts that people cannot ride if they cannot pay. It seems like common sense, but these meager merchants do not intend to pay full price for the ride. They look for the conductor and offer money. The ticket to Turkmenistan costs about 150 yen. They offer about 50 yen for the ride. Ne? Ne? Ne? Ne? Ne? Ne? Ne? Ne? Ne? Ne? Ne? Ne? Ne? Ne? Ne? Ne? Ne? Ne? Ne? Ne? Ne? Ne? Ne? Ne? Ne?
They will sell what they can carry, and some of these merchants try to ride for free in the chaos. The conductors might seem harsh, but the fare keeps the railroad and their families going. In the economic confusion after the Soviet occupation, people were desperate to survive. The train finally departs. Finally underway, the stern faces of the women light up. <laughs> Young men sing Uzbek folk songs. The temperature inside the train was 40 centigrade. It was stuffy and smelly, but the ride was fascinating. In spite of it all, Ken enjoyed this part of the journey. The train arrives at Sharju, a border stop at Turkmenistan. As soon as it stops, the merchants get down to business. Trade is bustling and friendly between these two countries, even the petty trade of the poor. After traveling 10 hours, the merchants make only $20 in cash. Their profit, only five. The merchants quickly go home on the return train. Ken continues further west, where the legendary horse that was said to sweat blood was once thought to exist. The bazaar in Ashgabat, the capital city of Turkmenistan, is one of the largest in Central Asia. 10% of the population, or about 40,000 people, attend the bazaar. <笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑> Oh, oh. oh. oh. oh. oh. oh. oh. oh. oh.
Все да. вместе? Муж не, каждый один штук. А 250 долларов. И пики, а куда мы то еще не? Я хочу долларов дать. Молоко приятное же. А, ракутану, мирку, на маскара, каймас. あ、ちょっと気はさの、ラクダのミルク。あ、ラクダのミルク。あ。これでいくら。すごいです。A young boy said to Ken, when it's hot, everyone drinks camel's milk. It gives you energy. <laughs> A long time ago, the ruler of the Han Dynasty sent his men in search for the horse that sweats blood. It was said that this mythical animal could help him defeat the cavalry of his enemy. This special animal could survive without water or food for months and could sweat blood. The Akalteke horses are the real descendants of these horses of legend. This was the first time Ken had experienced such intense heat. あの、あの、60度。60度。60度の暑い風。
It's nighttime. We're about to enter what used to be Persia. However, Ken's trip is about to take an unexpected turn. At 6 a.m., he arrives at Siracus, a town bordering Turkmenistan and Iran. Two years ago, a momentous occasion was celebrated there. The Silk Road between Beijing and Istanbul was connected in an unbroken line via rail. Eleven heads of state from various countries attended the event. However, trains do not pass through Iran and Turkmenistan now. Many countries were cool to the idea of Central Asia having access to the Persian Gulf. Ken Ogata thought to himself, the tracks are still here, they're still connected. That night, Ken went to Mashhad, the third largest city in Iran. It is a holy site for the Shiite Muslims. In Mashhad, the women were wearing black charters. He boards another train at Mashhad and heads for Tehran. Since leaving Turfan in China, Ken has traveled 7,000 kilometers. It's the equivalent of traveling the length of Japan 1.5 times. Ken thought, my journey's halfway finished. The train chases the sun, speeding at 90 kilometers per hour. Wow, that was a good catch. This train is on a single line. In order to prevent collisions, the conductor carefully consults the schedule as he passes each station during the trip. The train makes a temporary stop and the passengers exit the train. After bathing, they head to a prayer room in the station. 
they complete their fifth and final prayer. Then, they reboard the train and sleep the rest of the way. As the train makes its way toward Tehran, the sun rises from behind the mountain. It's morning. Lack of sleep and the unusual diet has taken a toll on Ken. He is at the brink of exhaustion. Thank you. At 7 a.m., he arrives in Tehran. The trip from Mashhad to Tehran took 14 hours. Here, Ken will catch another train. He drags his feet as he climbs the stairs. Ken is traveling south from Tehran. He's going to the ancient city of Isfahan. It used to be a bustling city to the point where people would say Isfahan is half the world. Islamic culture has developed a system of art that covers a surface with intricate patterns. The dome of this mosque is covered in scroll work. The printed textiles that Isfahan is renowned for are also covered with scroll work. An error of just a millimeter would ruin the entire design. This printer said it took him 25 years to master his craft. Currently, these printers and carvers are facing a dilemma. No one is interested in learning their craft. I'm Japan. Um,
While sitting next to the lake, Ken heard an interesting story. It was the story about a town called the Desert Star and the Zoroastrians that lived there. People there worshipped fire, and they have kept the fire burning at the fire temple for 1,500 years. There are two towers just a few miles from the city of Yazd. People call them the Towers of Silence. Ken learned that this was a place Zoroastrians buried their dead. In the 7th century BC, Zarathustra created a religion called Zoroastrianism. It quickly spread throughout Persia. After Persia was destroyed by Muslims, the devout Zoroastrians refused to convert to Islam and continued to worship in Yazd. When Zoroastrians die, they carry the body to this tower and they let vultures strip the corpse. How many people were laid to rest on these towers? Today was Kenogata's 60th birthday. I <laughs> think The dead were laid to rest here, their spirits said to rise to the heavens, and the remaining body to be consumed and bleached by the sun. The burial rites at the Towers of Silence continued until they were banned by the government just 20 years ago. However, at the Fire Temple in Yazd, the fire of faith still burns steadily. Apparently, the fire has never gone out since the Zoroastrians inhabited this area 1,500 years ago. In Iran, 99% of the population is Muslim. However, in a small village near Yazd called Muharabik, the entire population is Zoroastrian. The village has a population of just under 100. It's like walking around in ancient ruins. Yeah. 
سلام سلام A young girl offered Ken the hospitality of her home. Salam. Salam. Oh, beautiful. The house, made from sun-dried bricks, was fairly spacious and bright. Zoroastrian women wear brightly colored patterned choders, unlike the black choders that Muslim women wear. The neighbors have gathered to bake naan in the community oven. Ken received permission to climb on the roof. Marcelinis, Marcelinis, Marcelinis. How old are you? ジュニさん。ジュニさん。毎日何やってる? On the roof, Ken could see all around the village. これ何あ、ついた時こうやって揺らして。はいはい、そうですね。ああ、上流、上流、上流。あ、すいません、掃除するとですよね、これ。だって埃だけだもん。こうですよね。日本。お母さん。ジャパンって知ってます?ジャパ
traveling further west. Ken was thinking about what Istanbul would be like, but at the Iranian-Turkish border, Ken's plans were derailed once again. The tracks that connect Iran and Turkey were closed down five years ago. The Turkish government is concerned over the Kurds living on both sides of the border. It took six hours for the film equipment to clear customs. Finally, they were in Turkey. The legendary Mount Ararat, mentioned in the tale of Noah's Ark, was before them. The final destination, Istanbul, is still 1,900 kilometers away. This portion of the road is under heavy guard. For about 4,000 years, the Kurds have called vast areas on both sides of the Turkish-Iranian border their home. Currently, 2.5 million Kurds live in Turkey and Iran and have been separated by a border created after the First World War. Unwanted by both countries, they endure hard lives in each. To suppress the Kurdish independence movement, the Kurds on the Turkish side are under martial law. While traveling, they ran into a young shepherd on their way. When the shepherd learned of their destination, he invited them to his village. It was on the road. Okay. Huh, you go. He asked a friend to look after the sheep and ran back to their car. Ken is on his way to the boys' village. Daoud lives in Kepkoi. There, 1,000 Kurds live in a village consisting of 80 houses. Currently, there are 1.4 million Kurds living in Turkey. The Turkish government denies, however, that any Kurds live within its borders. They claim they are just Turkish people living in the mountains that do not speak the language. As a result, they are educated in Turkish. Since the lessons are not in the Kurds' native tongue, school can be difficult, but somehow the kids enjoy it. Unfortunately, this village school was closed. Yeah. 
あ先生がいないそうですねこれ普通は7歳から行くんですけど、うん、8歳でも今は行ってないそうですね先生がいないそれで俺とないよえっメンゲルで送ってるぜそれ行ってみるまるってやるみるやねもうなんかあの来たんですけどわけがわからないまま行ってしまったそうで今は先生がいないそうですねじゃあ勉強するのにどうするのね、何する置くよ、そのそんな、オルテナのやつさ。オルテナのやつさ、置くみよだ。もう、勉強しませんって。で、だって、あの、人間として、大人になっていくのに、読んだり、書いたり。えー、しなきゃならないから。いや、に、置くな、チョコね、無理やつ、チョコね、無理。なす、オルテナのやつ。オルテナのやつ。ええ、ライン、ゲルセアに、置くです。ゲルマン、ゲルセ。あまあ、ビルによるぜ。カシン、カシン。うん、あの、もちろん大切ですけど、うんうん、先生がいなければ学べないから、待つしかないって言ってます。多分く、冬に来るだろうっていう。teachers try to avoid assignments in Kurdish villages。their job is to teach Turkish to the Kurdish children。as a result、Kurdish guerrillas consider them to be enemies。Twenty teachers have been killed over the last four years. They are interested in Japan. They would like to visit. えっと逆に言えばえクルドクルドというのにすごく興味があってあの独立したいというか独り立ちになりたいっていうかえ自分の国を作りたいっていうかそういうことを思ってるでしょ？ゆるきはね、アスマスキュル。この島アスマスキュル。あのゆるきはなく。あなたは何になる？さあ入れるでねえ、まだ死ぬよ。わら、ブザーラルブラックタンスラ、お前で死ぬよ。ああ、あの仕事が終わってからあ,あ,あの勉強またしたいって言ってます。ああ、はい。でそんなねえ、プマクイスよ。フィーブマサビオレットのドクターからなんです。ドクター医者になりたいそうです。The Turkish army started making their rounds as we talked to the children. The villagers of Kapkoy looked like they had made peace with the Turkish army. However, we may never know the truth. Ken felt deep sadness in his heart. He realized that though these people had lived on this land for 4,000 years, they had no country and were divided by a border that cut one people into two. Before Ken left the village, he wanted to say goodbye to Daoud. Ken found him in the same field where he had first spotted him with his sister.
これは何？シュネ？ベイネシ？チーズです。チーズ。えっ、ー、とね、タルツ。えっ、ー、とこれは僕が、えー、昼間のためにホテルで用意してもらったパンだけど食べてみる？シュネ？カラーホテルでオーレイメイチンハズルムシライエルムさん。ん？大丈夫だ。チキンだ。どうもありがとう。うん。それで、はいあなたにも。あっちゃん。うん。で、<笑>代わりにダルツのあれを俺が食べていいか。そのやりね、そのやるやびれるみたい。じゃあ、うん。うん。どうだい。これこれ。する？カズナする？リゼル。すごい美味しいって。うん。これは硬いね。直接でよ。<笑>まあ。I'll never forget that you have dreams to become a doctor. Daoud smiled. Bye bye. Daoud's voice echoed through the canyon. A cargo train from Iran crosses the same canyon passages. If the tracks were open between the two countries, I would never have met Daoud, thought Ken. As we pass through the old gates of Ankara Castle, we walk into an area that used to be used as a stopping place for traders from the Silk Road. Here, merchants still buy and sell. During this trip, Ken Ogata lost his favorite red hat, the one he had worn while walking the Great Wall of China. So, he bought a new beret and vest. Daddy, lemon, lemon. <laughs> Berekat. 
Nasılsın? Güle güle kullanın. Sağ ol. Allah razı olsun. Siz ben de. Ne yapalım hemşerim işte. Okay. Biz böyle çalışırız. Ta çocuklukta böyleyiz. Sigara poket var yine. Böyle geçiniyoruz. Ne yapalım kardeş? Gelirim iyice. Allah'a şükür. Thank you. İdare edip gidiyoruz. Allah sağlık versin amin. Amin. Amin. Çok şükür. Allah bugünümüzden geri koymasın. Ne yapalım? Oh, hadi bereket versin. Oh, Umuyne. Sağ olun. Umuyne. Yeni. Limon. Limon. Yeni. Yeni. Limon. Bereket var yeni. Limon. Yeni. Limon. Bye. Bye. <laughs> At the Ankara station, the train that will take them to Istanbul, their final destination, was not that far off. It's cute. It's cute. However, there was one city Ken had wanted to visit since the beginning of the trip. It was a city known for its fine silk, a city historically connected to Japan. Nagano Prefecture, Japan, June 1997. In the city of Ueda, located in the Nagano Prefecture, a certain silkworm breeding co-op is bustling with silkworm cocoons for a week in June. For hundreds of years, these insects have created some of the world's finest silks. Japanese male silk moths, called shunrei, and Chinese females, called shugetsu, are bred together and create shunrei shugetsu cocoons. The most delicate silks are harvested from the cocoons of the shunrei shugetsu silkworms. These cocoons are exported to various countries along the Silk Road. The cocoons are processed into silk along the way. The silkworm was imported long ago into Japan through the Silk Road. The silk industry was an enormous factor in the success of Japan's economy starting in the Meiji era. And it influenced Central Asian countries on the Silk Road. The silk processed from the Shunrei Shugetsu traveled to Iran and Turkey where they are converted into the world's best Persian silk rugs. The weavers have to have small, nimble hands. As a result, 10 to 15-year-old girls are favored for the task. A carpet two meters long and three meters wide could take two years if a weaver worked 24 hours a day. The prices of these rugs range from 20,000 to over 100,000 US dollars. Bursa was one of the first cities built by the Ottoman Empire. Bursa was once crowded with merchants traveling the Silk Road. It still houses offices of businesses in the silk trade.
Like many old cities, some of the buildings are covered in rich architectural ornamentation. In Akchara, a village near Bursa, most of the people used to breed silkworms. However, five years ago, a canning factory opened its doors, and the village changed completely. Working at the factory meant more money for less labor. There used to be over 700 houses that were breeding silkworms. Now, there are only four. The older population have very little to do. They spend their time drinking tea day after day. An older gentleman told Ken, it's sad to see the silk industry disappear. Another elder added, there's nothing wrong with the way things are. It gives us more time to pray and relax. <laughs> when the time for prayer comes, the older people eagerly shuffle into the mosque and pray, facing Mecca. With time, even Akchara is changing. However, people still pray as they did in the past. Ken Agata boards the train to Istanbul. This will be the last stop on his journey along the Silk Road. Rigid winters, blistering summers. The journey took 31 days on the Silk Road Railway, and now Kenagata is speeding to his final destination. Evet. It was the first ocean Ken had seen during his 12,000 kilometer journey. It's not a lake, it's an ocean. One can tell by the breeze. The last train stop in Asia. He's arrived at the Haider Pasa train station in Istanbul.
海の匂いなんだか山と砂漠と草原とずっとそういうとこばっかり歩いてきたような気がするんで海海。The other side of the Bosphorus Strait is Europe. Ame no Istanbul. This long trip is the first time of Ame. The Mekumi no Ame. Katsu-san. カツシンタロウさんに言われたことがあります。また日本の芝居いいんだから西洋の西洋のもんなんかやらなくてていいよ。えー、でもねカツさんちょっと横道へそれぞれ見たいんですよね。横道なんかそれなくたっていいんだよ。そんな風に言われました。こうやって。日本を出てとことこ歩いたり汽車に乗ったりこれもまあ言ってみれば横道なのかもしれませんでもあのメインストリートより田んぼのあぜ道の方がふと面白いななんて思うこともあるんですよね。冬と夏でこんなに激しく国境を越えたことは今までありません滞在中の十分の区はほとんど国境越えで時間時間を費やされました21世紀には北京とイスタンブールに記者が開通するんだそうですけどもさあいろんな国のいろんな事情があってレールの幅も違うし簡単にそれが北京からイスタンブール行ってイスタンブールからヨーロッパまで果たしてうまく通じることができるでしょうか時にマイナス30度時にプラス60度でも人間ってしたたかでしなやかでずぶといもんだっていうことを思い知らされました不毛のようなところに根を張ってその貧のどん底のような日々の暮らしの中から僕は医者になりたいっていうような。少年の目の輝きを見せられるとああ希望とか夢とかあるけど本当の人間の勇気っていうものはそういうもんかなってなんか思い知らされたっていうか Shilkrode The Balkan Express, leaving for Belgrade, was waiting in the Serkeji station, the first European train station on this journey.
Balkan Express leaves the station. Ken knew the Orient Express was not running due to the conflict in Bosnia. As he watched the train pass by, I wonder where these tracks lead to.